Hey, really glad to have you back with us again as we continue in our series about the perfect gift. And uh, today I'd like you to uh, look at Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 10 to 11 with me as we uh, just take a moment to see what God's Word has to say. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those uh, really are unusual gifts for us today and in our time, but they were valuable and they were not only valuable, but they were practical and they also had a spiritual content to them, which was very important. See, the wise men entered the house and fell on their knees and started to worship the child. One of the, as we talked last week, one of the wise men opened up his chest, uh, his treasure chest, and and presented to Mary and Joseph this gift of frankincense. And we talked about how frankincense represented Jesus's future, uh, where he was going to be, that he was the high priest, he was the go-between between us and God, and that he understands us because of all that he went through as he grew up uh, in his life. And so when we're going through difficult times, Jesus knows what it feels like to, to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be forgotten, uh, to be left outside. Now we get to the point that we want to talk about today, and that's the next wise man moves in to worship uh, this child. And he turns around, and at this time, he, he pulls out his treasure chest, and he opens it, and as he's lifting out this gift, he unwraps it where it was probably covered in some type of material or some type of cloth to protect it from the long journey that they were on, which was dusty and rough and everything else. And he reaches out with it and he steps forward. But as he's stepping forward, a little different than maybe even the other wise men that gave his gift, he's kind of hesitant. Uh, there's a little drawing back from him. He's not, not to the point that he's not willing to give a gift, but literally there's a hesitation of what the gift stands for and, and what it means. And slowly and carefully, he unwraps his gift and he reaches out with it as he gives it to Mary and Joseph. As the cloth is being taken off, the gift is now revealed. And that gift is myrrh. The second gift we're talking about today is myrrh. And I don't know, I, the Bible doesn't really say anything about this, but I really believe that the wise men just heard the breath of Mary being taken away when she saw the gift. And maybe Joseph was just kind of grunting and going like, oh, you know, that, that sigh uh, coming in him. And maybe as that wise man looked at Mary's eyes, he would see tears starting to come. And he would see the pain uh, just kind of rushing across the face of Joseph. See, the gift he was revealing was that myrrh, and myrrh in that time had a different meaning than maybe we understand. Maybe our lack of knowledge and uh, the, you know, the understanding of what myrrh represents cushions our emotions and our feelings, and we don't really understand what it meant for these two, this young couple, when they saw it. See, one of the main uses for myrrh was embalming of those people that have passed away. It also was used as a perfume and an anointing. Uh, in fact, the high priest would anoint the temple with myrrh. What they would do, they would, they would not only be anointed themselves, but they would, they would anoint every piece of furniture and every instrument that was used in the temple. Uh, and the temple itself was anointed with myrrh uh, before the sacrifice that was done yearly. It was an unbelievable opportunity before the sacrifice was given for this to be done. It was also a medicine, uh, which was very practical for this young couple. It also spoke of bitterness. When you look at that word myrrh, you look in the Hebrew, 
it, it relates, the definition of it is bitter. And, and there's multiple stories about Moses when they were in the wilderness. They came upon a lake uh, where they were, they were thirsty and they found that the water in that lake was bitter and they, they gave it the name Amara. And uh, it, it spoke of myrrh or it spoke of bitterness. Uh, um, we understand it is a part of it. We need to also really understand there is such a correlation with myrrh and really the life of Jesus after he started growing up and he came into his manhood. Myrrh also speaks of eternity. Uh, it's a special, it has a special ability to last for a long period of time. In fact, many have studied that the fragrance can last for over a hundred years if it's in the right conditions. I believe Mary and Joseph realized this, this gift was more than practical, it was more than valuable, but it was speaking of the future for their son. The Bible, you know, it's pretty clear and there are some unbelievable correlations between uh, this myrrh, this gift of myrrh, and Jesus' life. And I, maybe I can paint a little bit of a picture for you in the next couple of moments so I'd like to share the relationship between the myrrh and the life of Jesus. See, the, the symbolic part of myrrh was it represented Jesus' death. When myrrh is harvested, the tree is repeatedly struck to it bleeds out its resin. That, that's kind of like a milky fluid, just like we were saying about the frankincense. It, it, had to, it was beaten, and then as it was wounded... It would, it would run out. See, when myrrh is harvested, that, that bleeding starts to flow. It is so reminiscent of what happened to Jesus. The wounding of this, and it was not only a, a tree, it was a small tree, but it was a thorny tree. It didn't carry very many branches, but this small bush had thorns in it, which later on will speak about, you know, as well. And the resident used this fragrance or a seal for wrapping uh, the linen around those that had passed away. It's also known as an oil of healing, which is very unique when we start thinking about everything. See, when, when that myrrh is tapped and, and out of the tree, and by wounding that tree, it allows the resident to bleed out and become hard and glossy. As the myrrh tree was struck, so the resident would bleed out. Jesus hung on a tree, and he was struck, and he was wounded, causing him to bleed. Just as the myrrh gum was used in an ancient time for a healing balm, and was for the curing of sickness, it was by Jesus' stripes that we are healed, and we need to understand that, that in when Jesus was at final sacrifice on the cross, he cured our sickness of sin in our lives. Interesting that the branches of the myrrh tree doesn't, uh, as I was saying, doesn't have a lot of leaves, but it has thorns. And we know the story when Jesus was crucified, that they put a crown of thorns on his head, and they drove it into his head. The correlation is beyond just by accident. It, it, there is such a correlation that there had to have been some type of connection between the wise men understanding or a revelation of the Holy Spirit that prophetically was painting a picture in their lives. In fact, it's even said that in the ancient times, they would take more uh, and they would cause, uh, shape it in, the resident, they would shape it into a crown and they would place it on the head of people. And as the sun would shine on that crown of myrrh, it would melt and the myrrh would just drip down upon the person, bringing a fresh aroming, uh, uh, aroma of fragrance, but it also would bring this, really, this anointing that would come upon them. Myrrh and its symbolic part of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ is unbelievably real. And maybe with saying those things, I, I believe that 
we need to understand that Mary and Joseph were picturing some of that. Here they had a brand new baby, a beautiful baby. Their life was like, wow, what we're, where are we going to go? What is going to happen? What is the future going to be? And now comes this revelation. Now it starts to come that this child was born to die. Here's what it says in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Wow. Do you, do you hear the correlation? And if you read through Isaiah 53 and follow through, you, you keep hearing this whole relationship between myrrh and what happened in Jesus' life. Can I just share this with you as maybe one of the key points that I want to share today is myrrh is a gift of sacrifice. Jesus came to be our sacrifice. These wise men in, in their wisdom were prompted by the Holy Spirit to give these gifts to, to set us on a journey even for our lives today. So when we think of the gift of myrrh, we should also be thinking about Jesus came to this earth. But he came to this earth to die for our sins. In the midst of all the joy and all the celebration of Christmas, it's not always fun following Jesus. It's not always easy following Jesus. It's not always easy being a child of God. There is a sacrifice that comes in our lives. And there is a continual ongoing battle between our old self and our new self. We need to understand that this is a battle that we can win because it's already been won by Jesus. There's a battle between our fears. There's a battle between our desires. There's a battle over our self-centered lifestyle, being willing to sacrifice our wants and, and our needs to follow Jesus. We, we need to we walk in that same thing. Jesus set an example to us when he gave his life for us. Uh, we need to understand sacrifice means doing for others when we would rather help ourselves. The dictionary says this is a definition of sacrifice. The act of giving up something that you want to keep, especially in order to get to do something else or to help someone. See, there's an ongoing thing where as a child of God, God calls us to this. Romans uh, uh, 12 verses 1 to 2 shares this with us. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for yourself, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Oh, what a verse. And that's what God is asking of us. Uh, this is how this story, uh, this is not just for Mary and Joseph, but it's for us. That God wants to help us to change in the way we are and the way we live our lives. To live as a Christian is costly and, and, and it's great. We have to choose to sacrifice our time and our money and, and our energy and our friendship and our talent and sometimes our status. But when we sacrifice what God wants us to give up, then we grow spiritually. Then we truly find out what we were truly created to be and where we're supposed to be. See, God is not asking us to do this by himself. God is saying, I've sent you the Holy Spirit to come into your life. I want to transform the way you think. I, I, I want to work in your life. I want to give you life more abundantly. I just, I wanted to share that Jesus understands this. Uh, you know, it, it may come to this whole point of giving up control it might uh, of your life. It might come 
to allowing God to lead you. It might come to be taken places when you don't really know where God is going to take you, but you trust him because you hear his voice. And because of your relationship with him, you know it's him telling you to go there. It's not man. It's not religion. It's not these other things, but it's him. He's saying, you know what? I, I, I want to desire in you today to reach out and do good deeds. I want you to do something for this person. I want you to give this, this financial gift and you're going like, but that's the last $20 bill. I got it in my wallet. And you're asking me, God, to give it away. That's a sacrifice. I'm giving something that I, I really want to hang on to and I think I need. And, and, and maybe it's some habits or, or attitudes or unforgiveness. Someone has truly hurt you and you don't want to forgive them. And we need to do that. I want you to know that Jesus understands what we're going through in this point of sacrificing and where we're going. See, Jesus gave up his desires in the garden when he said, not my will, but yours, Father. He, he was really spending time in that garden, talking, pleading to God that this cup of crucifixion of dying would pass him. And then we find that he turns around and even though he doesn't want to go through the suffering and pain, he says, I'll do what you say, dad. I'll follow you. I'll, I'll do your will. And then he sacrifices his life for you and for me and for our sins. Here's what we, we see in Luke 9, 22. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Unbelievable. God is wanting us to continue to sacrifice. There's, there's a part. And, and it, we don't sacrifice animals anymore, but we're called to give a sacrifice of praise and, and, and to sacrifice time to pray and be in an intimate relationship with God. Make choices that maybe everybody else wouldn't be doing. It, it's kind of unique. If you look at Isaiah 53, it speaks about there where Isaiah is, is sharing that we are like sheep gone astray. We fall in our own path. There is a tendency that we're like sheep. We want to go where we want to go. See, sheep have a tendency to want to follow the herd. They will go where they want to go. And so it is sometimes with us. We'll follow what other people in the world are doing instead of following what Jesus is asking us to do. And so God is making a way. I want you to know today that we are called to sacrifice, but it is not a difficult thing for us to do. So we need to understand that. We are wise men and wise women. We come together to worship God and to offer God our best gift. That's us, to offer ourselves. We are followers of God, desiring to be in the presence. It is so amazing what God can do with, with us, even in our shortcomings, even in, in our lack, he can turn around and use us to an unbelievable use to touch others around us. God loves us unconditionally, and he wants to use us to make a difference and to bring his kingdom to this earth. Myrrh is a gift of sacrifice and the dying to self. It's a gift that, that makes us all a little uncomfortable, but it's worth it when we see how God will transform us into being in his likeness, and when we see the fruits of it. Jesus died for us to overcome our anger and unforgiveness, our pride, our greed, our lies, our lustfulness, uh, our critical spirit, our judgmental spirit. We don't have to walk in those things anymore. They've been paid for. Jesus died. Jesus took them to the cross. We don't have to pick them up and carry them anymore. We can walk in victory. We can walk in freedom. This child was born to die. I just wanted to share this and really in pulling this together. Was it, I don't know if you thought, thought about this, but it was unique that the wise men gave myrrh to Jesus at his birth. And while Jesus was hanging on the cross, one of the soldiers dipped a sponge 
in wine and myrrh and reached it up and offered it to Jesus. And the myrrh was to deaden the pain of what Jesus was feeling while he was hanging out on the cross. And Jesus refused to take it because he wanted to carry the full weight of our sin so that we could be set free. So my question to you today is, what will you offer Jesus? What gift will you bring to him this Christmas season? This Christmas, we need to be careful that we don't get just caught up in the birth of the child, but that we remember the birth of that child speaks of his death, which brings freedom to us, which sets us free to walk in life abundantly and full of joy. Would you pray with me as we just close this day, but start a new day with Christ as our sacrifice? Father, thank you for your son's sacrifice. Thank you for his willingness to come to earth and pay the price we never could. This Christmas, help us to keep in mind not just the birth, but also the saving work for us all through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Give us the strength to die to self in areas that we may struggle with that have become strongholds. And let us find those that we can pour out your love and give to them and care for them. We need to change. And the desires that we follow in our lives need to change to be the desires that you have for us. May we be directed by your Holy Spirit to touch people's lives, not only over this Christmas season, but continually until you come. That we would be a representation of you, that people would see you through us as we care for one another, encourage one another, and lift one another up. May God bless you, and may you have an unbelievable week this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>